Hello everyone, my name is John Wedgwood Clark, and it's a great pleasure to be able to contribute to the Charles Causley Literature Festival this year. Um, Charles Causley is a poet who I greatly admire for his formal skill, his willingness to experiment, for his kindness, and for his compulsive an extraordinary exploration of the way in which pain can figure itself in a way that is deeply personal and also publicly available. I titled this talk A Cornish Childhood because I was brought up in St Ives um, and born in Penzance and it's something that since I've returned to the West Country, having left Cornwall at 18, gone to London, lived in Yorkshire for a long time, that I've returned to thinking about. So I've written over the past 18 months a collection of poems about growing up in St Ives. It's more of a poem memoir, I think, um, in the sense that it's sequential, there's a strong sense of narrative and it's a kind of storytelling mode that maybe in the past I've avoided but there comes a point in your life when you need to address some material and it was just the moment to do it so I'll say a bit more about that but my first collection Ghost Pod came out in 2013 and there's a poem in it probably the only poem in it that that is the only poem in it that's directly related to growing up in St Ives. And it's about fishing off the end of Smeaton's Pier. So imagine me as a sort of eight or nine year old boy fishing off the end of the pier. I have cousins who are fishermen, an uncle who is a fisherman, who is a fisherman. They have a very successful boat fishing out of Newlyn. What did I do? I read about fishing. <laughs> Hence what I do. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm going to read you this, this poem. Grey mullet, their mouths were small, lips too soft to tether a run, or bear their weight when hoisted up by hook alone. I never owned a landing net, but read the book and rolled the crumb of bread into a seed of dough that hid the hook. Sometimes the bait would dance like a table at a seance until it fell away, eclipsed. More often, they just hovered by the steps around green chains, scaling the distance between boat and shadow, oblivious as if they listened out for someone to arrive, enthralled by a sound on the edge of their hearing. Grey mullet are fiendishly difficult to catch, and they do tend to hang around in harbours. And for me, they're a sort of, I don't know, spirit fish. I've uh, had a long connection with. Now, I am going to read some poems from my new collection, which is called Boy Thing. And it's all about, well, you'll find out. It begins with a, a short poem, because this is all about memory. <clears throat> of course, this is my memory. And I think throughout our lives, we often have memories that we go back to, touchstone memories. But when you start to think about them a little bit more, you start to put pressure on them, that shorthand of memory starts to spread, to smear, to become something else. We lived in a house on Porthminster Point for a little while, which I don't know if you know, St Ives Bay, amazing views. Just in front of us was the railway track, then there were some sea meadows, then there was the sea. And I would place with a friend of mine, pennies on the track. So this is really one of those um, pennies on the track uh, poems. 
train goes across it, flattens the penny, you get this extraordinarily distorted um, object. Anyway, forge. <coughs> I'm reading off the screen because I've got a printer. Forge. Let's have a look shifty, that's why. Forge. How strange a currency memory becomes, like the shiny bronze foot of a local dignitary. Throw it away and it returns. A penny I place on the shining rail of a coastal branch line. The steel chuckling across wooden sleepers as the slammed or diesel revs up the incline. To where I crouch at the anvil of the past, caught in the blare of its two-tone horn, the moment shearing as the wheels pass, undersides dripping like a hot black cliff, and found in its absence as I search among weeds and the rags of tissue strewn across ballast, the penny's dull head smeared brightly open, its legend burst into fluent copper. All right, we'll get into the section proper. Now my dad had a, uh, again, if you don't get a place in St. Ives by any chance, there's uh, the NSS uh, news agents. Well, that used to be our family shop. Now, my granddad used to work in the back of the shop preparing the meat, and my grand my dad learned, you know, that, that basic sort of um, cooked meats trade from him. And this is about a little ritual. We were good, <clears throat> we were good church going people, going to the Methodist uh, church on. Um, Bedford Road, and this is something we do every. Oh, I remember happening on Sunday mornings before we went to chapel, or maybe just after chapel. Anyway, it's called Fat Years, Lean Years, Fat Years. We begin with the Fat Years, we get to the Lean Years. Okay, Fat Years. Our shop was known for the home cooked hams my father bagged with honey and spice and floated in the blackened sarcophagus of the hay box to simmer overnight. The flame lowered to a blue flutter as he fitted the stainless steel lid, sealing its edges with canvas wads. After chapel, he'd break open the box, slump a ham on the marble counter, nick its cellophane bag with the tip of a knife, the ham juice Burting, like water struck from stone. A gush he'd catch in a handleless mug he handed to me, the fat a golden scurry as I drank. In the back of the shop there was a fire safe and I was absolutely fascinated by this fire safe. It's just weight, it's mass, it's otherworldliness. Very strange. And of course, it had money inside it. Fire safe. My father stooped to it as if to an oven in the tiny office of the stockroom. More stone than iron. Blue black as the rock the town was built on. A brass baton gripping fist stuck out above the keyhole as if to let you touch power, know the weight of paper it contained, the words fire safe and patented, stamped on a brass escutcheon a sheriff might have worn. After everything, it would be there among ashes and burnt rafters, waiting for a shop to rise again around its iron alpha et omega. The, show, the door shut with the terrible perfection of stone sliding down in a pyramid. The things it protected, dead or bound to die. Its opening at once a sacred moment 
the tabernacle and trapdoor in my bedroom floor through which the devil flamed as I lay feverish, immobile, my heart swinging shut, falling through space. This next one's about counting money. Counting money. I used to love piles of money on the table and and helping my dad count the money out. The Stenick River, which flows through St Ives, comes obviously down the Stenick Road, where it's all sort of culverted in now. But it then takes a little detour, which you can't see, under uh, Trigena Place. And it, used, and it flows under the back of the shop, where it flowed on. It still must still flow under the back of the shop. And I can really remember my dad lifting up the manhole cover in the shop one day and showing me the river and it just being extraordinary that our that this living thing this bright water was under our shop anyway it's about that it's about and it's called fiduciary currency fiduciary in the sense of currency based on trust and in a way that was what was starting to disappear from our our family in a way fiduciary currency and of course, shop work is relentless. He never took holidays. Fiduciary currency. He let me count the takings and I built him colonnades of silver and copper. Turned the queen's head right way up on crisp and furry banknotes. Sellotaped the old torn skins, scrunched and unfolded. Biro tattooed and smelling of sweat and tobacco, silver running through them all. A numismatist of desire, I felt strangers' hands in strangers' pockets, in strangers' hands now here, furthering the excitement of dirty notes on the covered rosewood table no one spilled a drop on without leaping up. He folded them into money bags, tallying wads against the daily wallop of the pricing stamp he plunged at cans, its revolving head of figures like a mechanical tumbler in a cage. What we took, poured away. It all poured away like the stream running under the back of the shop where I sat on a throne of cardboard boxes under flypapers jewelled with flies. He hooked the manhole cover up and through its iron frame I saw water racing over stone, gold in the light of his ever-ready torch. It poured while he poured away in the sound of the van before I was up, off to empty the waters at the shop, those brimming trays of condensate he edged from under fridges, not spilling a drop and sluiced down the drain. In the back of the shop, we had a generator because the fridges this is during the 70s, um, if they were turned off, of course, everything would spoil. So he'd lost quite a bit of stock. So he had a generator installed to ensure a constant supply of electricity and uh, it just throb all day long. This is called the grind. Black sails turned in the fuel gauge as the generator throbbed its insurance against power cuts, the blow of souring. Time moved in shouldered processions of bacon flitches, torn pages of buns, the wires smooth rupture through cheese. Deep in the engine's beat, I watched him in his study of knives, bone shoulders, clarify flesh with cleaver and saw. Heel-pocked linoleum darkened down aisles as the mop flailed and the sails turned like the song 
of the little but Dutch boy, I loved him to sing me. Tick tock, tick tock, went the funny old clock. And the wheels of the mill went round and round and round Went the wheels of the mill His voice in the song's foreverness A turning pain as the sails span forward in the wind I think I could sense that something was going wrong In the relationship between my parents So this is a poem I suppose about detecting that and the anxiety that that can induce in a young susceptible child. I don't know if you remember anyone who had a transistor radio. Um, you used to be able to listen beyond the deep end as it were to police radio, pick it up on the on FM. I did a Jack and I can remember listening out and um, I think I had sort of some compulsive uh, behaviour at the time, and I think um, that and anxiety and this hearing this thing on the radio um, disturbed me. Anyway, police frequencies between rising and going, over and over to wash my raw hands. I held the radio to my ear in bed and tuned applause into the cold nowhere of static. The house silent but for pebbles drawling down in the cove. The meter's wandering tick, its steel planetary ring spinning in the cupboard. A wash with space. My trawling through the deep end court, the voices of the coppers breaking in, to find the dead man in his armchair, staring through the airwaves into me, death whispering through the hiss, I erased him too. Now wash your hands of this. I had a friend whose father worked on the railways, and this friend of mine had the most amazing, um, to me at the time, um, layout in his attic of model trains. To me, it was like heaven going up into heaven when I, I went up to see that. And it, it sort of caught this vision of this, this memory of his layout with also going with him and counting the lighthouse flashes, uh, counting the intervals between the um, lighthouse flashes of Goodreavy Lighthouse. I truly remember. Anyway, um, yeah, this is simply called A Vision of Heaven. We ran with the dog and stopped at the gate to count the intervals between lighthouse flashes. One second equals one thousand said in your head, his father had told him. His father, who worked on the railways, who said smoke was unburnt diesel who built him a model railway in his attic. Little trains zipped and sparked around through the same tunnel, past the same trees, made of moss and twigs. Lifelikeness perfected in the real light of the front of the train and the dining car with table lamps and cutlery, each identical, each empty, a glimpse of eternity going round and round, utterly unenterable as the light flashed and we stood at the gate counting. My dad left us and this is really about the summer after he left. Um, that sense of time opening up, of being forgotten, and of trying to work things out, of having things worked out for you by the landscape around you. You know, not having the words, but being drawn to things that spoke 
on my behalf of what I felt. Um, you know, what caught my eye? I always quite like that. I think it came from Philip Fob Bobsborn, but I think Heaney was fond of quoting it. The idea that description is revelation, so that what catches your eye is going to tell something about what you're interested in. So this is a poem about what caught my eye during that time. Now, it's about, it's called Ichneumon wasp, I don't know if you know about the Ichneumon wasp, but it lays its eggs inside the cabbage white butterfly and the larvae hatch and eat the caterpillar out from the inside while it's still alive. And I think I read about this at school or heard about it um, at some point. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, anyway, you'll, 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 you'll get the drift. But that's what, that's what happens. And our house, I remember that summer was just besieged by these, uh, by caterpillars and butterflies and, of course, the consequences. Ichneumon wasp. The bedroom blind, bright red. My father came into the room. Look after her, he said, then gently closed the door on his voice. After he'd gone, my mother hugged me tighter and the silence swelled around us, twisting each tuft of the copper-green carpet, piercing light with long glass songs. I remember breathing and not. I found myself watching caterpillars, so many of them, a soft plague pressed into door jams, window ledges, the rims of empty white paint tins, as if the sky had embroidered our house with living stump work. I learnt their plump green and yellow bodies, their bristles like first beard hair, the jaws that made skeletons of wild cabbage on the headland. As I touched and stroked their life into mine, they bunched and knotted, or lifted and waved their tails as if magnetised by an invisible source. I watched through days, through the cracks in days, the slow exposure of chrysalids sharpening into armour, genie slippers, grey speckled pockets of hidden weather, blowing hooked feet into wings. But there were others who just grew fat, their sap green and pollen yellow clouding from within. Something swelled inside their skins, like strange voices whispering fog. Until one morning, in bright sunshine, from each of them hung clutches of yellow cocoons, their bellies torn like rotten hammocks. I was a great one for making wine, gathering stuff. I think my mum allowed me to make wine to distract myself. I also had an uncle who was, well, he was called an uncle, but, you know, he was a family friend who was into wine making. So, um, I think C.L. Berries, uh, country wines or whatever. Anyway, I was quite into all this stuff. But our first attempt was disastrous. After he left. We had things out of all proportion, misread the recipe to a pint ad, not to every pint, and made of our wine a gallon of syrup. It slowed the yeast, it slowed the summer. The airlock heaved its bubble round the bend so rarely, like the thousand mile digit in the odometer. Look away and you missed it for another thousand miles. The summer stretched away through the empty landscape of the house. In a corner by the radiator, both distance and destination, the amber demijohn kept up its trek of tiny bubbles rising from the lunarscape of yeast. Like life inside a paperweight trying to escape, or the necklaces of ants that made their way to the clear sweet pools of ant killer oozed on the windowsill, their bodies 
surrounding them like petals. This next poem is called Augury. I can distinctly remember, if, again, if anyone knows St Ives Bay, you'll remember back in the, in the 70s, is when I yeah, came to consciousness, really, there was a power station at the mouth of the Hale Estuary. Um, they blew it up in the late 70s, early 80s, I think it was, about 1980 maybe even. But they raffled, they raffled the, um, as a prize, the opportunity to blow it up. Anyway, again, this is a poem about a sort of sense of dislocation, if you like, and suspension, hiatus, interruption, so maybe suitable for this moment too. Anyway, it's about growing an avocado, and if you've ever avocado from a seed, have you ever done that? It just, if you're a child, it's like forever this thing takes to start growing. It's a real test of time and patience, which I think I had the time, but maybe not the patience. <clears throat> Augury. The seed so egg-like, something good must come from its weeks suspended over water. We'd bought the avocado from the shop where they raffled the chance to blow up the power station stack. Something struck the window like a clod of mud. I found the dead yellow hammer, but couldn't put it together with the sound its taproot ached through air into water, green breath brewing in its hairs. I turned the white shoot daily as it tilted, a plate, spinner's stick, balancing the sun, and never saw the chimney fall, punched in the gut, a little smoke whispering from its mouth as it flopped, a blue column of absence in its place. This next one, said Arnold Porth, Mr. Point again, um, my brother had the most amazing collection of airfix aeroplanes, well, he decided to um, burn them all that summer in a bonfire, to which I added my own things of importance connected with Certain kinds of masculinity, I suppose. Anyway, it's called Epic Meltdown, and um, here you go. Epic Meltdown. Under the blackthorn, above the cove, I wove a camp for action men. Around a tuft of grass for fire, with their kit bags, canteens and guns to hand, I left them, growing stranger in the night, making the field another home, through which wind frisked, rain pelted to the elasticated marrow of their plastic limbs. On visits to replenish supplies, salad, seeds, mugs of mud, I pulled them to pieces, swapping fixed for gripping hands, bearded heads for clean-shaven, until who was who was no one. As the summer ran into the fog, I gathered their slug-filled bodies, snail shitty kit, jamming all into the belly of the turretless chieftain tank, I pushed over the patio like a pram to where my brother's bedroom heaven of airfix fighters and bombers, painted with single-haired brushes, Decals tweezered on, unbroken, drooled in the bonfire he'd made of them. A rip of light I drove the tank in two and watched the plastic sag and loop, men born melting from its womb. Um, like I say, I was brought up a good Methodist and um, but there was a sort of crisis point around this time uh, where I lost my faith. Um, there were a succession of men who would occasionally come in and take Sunday school, which I just loved when we finally got somebody 
we were just singing Yes, Jesus Loves Us and crayoning, you know, the Red Sea, the Exodus, um, or whatever it might be. Anyway, this one's called Alternative Father Number One. In Sunday school, with the uncle who tested milk at the dairy, we looked into creation through the big brass microscope he'd bought in for Pentecost in a black wooden case. It was tarnished like a trumpet, old as the foxed engravings of Wesley in the men's room. He said no artist, even Leonardo, made anything as beautiful as a bird's nest. I stood on a chair to gaze through its peephole at water he'd collected from the pond where we sailed our boats on Good Friday. My eye a blank disk of light, guillotined by his slide, its spasming stained glass insurgent, all bite and fuck and filament, devouring what heavenly light of Christ was left in my heart's loud arrhythmic beating. The green jeweled watch, unhinged, springs and escapements tumbling through cold light. I grasped the microscope and knocked the jar off the table, its dark shout flung across the upper room's bare boards while they all sang on in the chapel. Just three more, <clears throat> I think. I'm going to read this one. Um, when I was at school on the, 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 on the Stenic, um, we had a wonderful English teacher called Miss Kogan, who um, set an essay competition, and I, I did very well. But I can really remember the story of the girl who did um, quite brilliantly. Um, it was about her father and a fishing trip that she'd gone on. And anyway, this is, this is about what was behind my clumsy attempt to enter that competition. Essay competition for Sarah. Her story was on fishing for rainbow trout with her father. I wrote about great sea battles from a 1922 history of the world and a pack of top trump cards. When she read the reservoir brightened with fish, I mouthed her word creel like a mystery. I knew why she'd won. Mine was burdened with armour, calibre of gun, its source in the winter's gales, sealed up and sunk. Ships would arrive in the bay like a town come visiting. I'd hear them drop anchor, steel chains landsliding into the night. While the wind hollowed beyond the lighthouse and the stones tore up the Atlantic, They'd keep their bows into the current, all pointing the same way. I'd watch them turn through the hours, men in yellow clustered and dispersed. One ran the length of a, length of a tanker, inside rusted superstructures. They made calculations. I didn't know how to tell the feeling how I was apart with them, looking back at a boy in the window of a house in a carol of longing. How when the wind dropped in the night, next morning they were gone. I'm just going to read... Um This poem called Atonement, I can remember of that summer obviously having very mixed feelings um, and restoring my father's cricket bat. So this is really about that and not really being very good at sports. Um, and it actually comes out of somebody saying to me while I was playing um, table tele tennis that I lacked the killer instinct. I lacked the killer instinct. 
I'm probably quite glad that I lacked the killer instinct. But then when I thought about it and wrote this poem, I thought, well, maybe there is some of that in me. It's just a case of releasing it. Atonement. As the rain fell, I sat in the stairwell and restored his bat, sanding its brown blade back to pale willow, rubbing linseed into its body, oil from the rag catching in the dent left in its spine by the ball he hit for four with it back to front he would stoop over me shaping me into that moment my hands on the bat handle covered by his as we cut and drove and pulled the world before i was born applauding the man i was part of i studied the impact crater of that shot, its compressed wood a sign of perfect timing. I wanted to live again in me, for my body to unfurl like the flowing letters of the autograph scorched into wood below the splice. My shots came too early, too late, hit air, not ball, soft dismissals that left me unpicked, that saw me left unpicked, but I had hidden talent. From the top of the steps to our house, I flicked a stone at him. As he approached, a giant in sheepskin, and the bay and the sky and hate said yes, and smote him out of nowhere that was me. You could have deafened me, blinded me, the poison in it turning him to rage. The shot I knew had driven him away. And finally from me, a slightly cheerier note poem. This is about moving from a house in Scarborough to the West Country and it's about saying goodbye to a house and being a father myself um, now. For sale. Gulls empty the sky, their squally cries loosening my hold on things. Late heat ticks in the tiles and guttering. The rowan's full breasts shine. In the attic bedroom where the wind's devouring voice in the throat of the chimney cried out in them. I folded up volcanoes, planets, kings and queens of England, wedged the mobile in the bin, ending interminable turnings in the internal thermals. It stored torsions so nearly time found reversible. Blue and white blobs the cornerstones of missing stories, diagrams, splotch beings, roll to a globe of paint and hair, a smear of weather. It's too late to touch up picked off wood chip shoals, herds of animals, hunters, whatever they saw in them at the edge of sleep. I stick down the flap of wallpaper over I am a person, penciled on plaster, their beds have gone, only patches remain where their heads would have been, precious heads that made this house flesh tender, heads tipped back as they looped arms round our necks to hold us, books slipping from hands to thump the floor above us like ripe fruit, the whole of us listening for the way they turned. Thank you very much for listening to me and it's been a pleasure to be part of the Charles Causley Literature Festival and I hope to meet you in person at some point. Goodbye.